Good morning, church in the cloud. Peace to you and to all yours in the mighty name of Jesus. Welcome to another edition of our combined service in the cloud. We thank God for being able to still preach and teach online despite the current lockdown. I would like to welcome all those joining us online across the planet for the first time today. We trust God that as you listen to this message, there will be a huge return on investment of your time in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I hope you all are keeping safe and obeying the instructions of those in authority for our benefit. Let us continue to pray for our leaders and encourage them every way we can, especially those of them who have rolled up their sleeves and who have led by example and selflessly so. May God bless them and keep them from harm of any kind in Jesus' mighty name. Today's online service is divided into two parts. The first part is a healing service. And the second part, we focus on sound teaching for every believer's spiritual fortification in this season and beyond. Let me start with my heartfelt condolences to those who have lost their ones home and abroad in the cause of COVID-19 pandemic. May the good Lord comfort and strengthen the families and friends left behind by those who are departed to the, from the earth due to this pandemic in Jesus' mighty name. I say amen to that. And for those who have tested po positive to COVID-19 among our leaders and our people, east, west, north, or south, if by God's grace you are still breathing this morning, there is hope for you even in your self-isolation. And the hope that I'm talking about is beyond the scope of human limitation, such as ours with very little negligible and inadequate Medicare. God Almighty who made a way out for many of the children of Israel who were beaten by fiery serpents in the wilderness while some of their companions died, God made a way for them and as they obeyed God, they were healed. That same God will also make a way for you today in your affliction. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As you hear the word of God this morning, please release your faith in the seven grace and the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ and yours will be the next testimony in the mighty name of Jesus. Please turn your Bible for this healing service online with me to Numbers 21 and I'm going to read from verse number 4 to verse number 9. Numbers chapter 21 beginning from verse 4 to verse number 9. He reads, and I quote, Then they journeyed from Mount Ur by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Hmm. Why have you brought us up out of, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loads this worthless bread. And there was manna from heaven, angels' food, that God was pouring down so that the people could be strong and healthy. They called that same miracle worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord <laughs> that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent 
and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. God spoke, and the fiery serpents came and started biting people. But when they repented and came to Moses and humbled themselves, Moses prayed for them. And God instructed Moses, I'm not taking away the fiery serpents, but I'm asking you to make a bronze serpent and hang it on a pole. And if anyone is bitten, like anyone has tested positive, if anyone is bitten, let him look at that bronze serpent on the pole, <laughs> and they will be healed. And as many looked at the bronze serpent, lived. This bronze serpent is symbolic of something yet to come. It was hung on the pole because the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, will one day fulfill literally what happened in the midst of the wilderness while people have been beaten by fiery serpents. If you turn with me to John chapter 3, verse 13, I'll read up to verse 16. The gospel according to John, chapter 3, verse 13 to 16. It reads, and I quote, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. You have a choice in the matter today, my friend, in self-isolation to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and to look up unto him so that you will not die in this epidemic. And I'm not trying to preach religion to you. I ask you to leave your religion for another religion. I'm saying that Jesus is the way, is the healer, is the savior. He has done so in my life and he will do so in your life if you cast aside every misconception that you have and look unto him who hung on the cross for us. The brass serpent is still the symbol of medicine today. You see that symbol in hospitals? It dates back to that day in the wilderness and that time in the wilderness when fiery serpents were biting people and they were dying. The Son of God hung on the cross for your sin and my sin so that we can be healed of every infirmity and sickness and disease by whatsoever name or nomenclature including viruses and all forms of attack. And I'm asking you to look unto him this morning, release your faith in his saving grace and healing power. And by the grace of God, yours will be the next testimony, whether you have tested positive or not. He can step into your situation and reverse the cause of sickness and disease. And that will be your portion as you obey this morning in Jesus' mighty name. And just in case you think that was then long ago, this is now. I would like to share two infallible truths with you that will boost your faith and eliminate your doubt. Two infallible truths. The first one, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8. Hebrews 13, 8 declares, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. That scripture simply means that what Jesus did before, he can do again today, and he's able to do it tomorrow. Because there is no limitation to his power. He's always at the peak of his power to heal, to deliver, and to set free. 
Come rain, come shine, anywhere, anytime. And therefore, what he did before, he can do for you today in Jesus' mighty name. Second, infallible truth. What Jesus did for one person, what Jesus did for the people of Israel, and did sometimes for one person, he can do for all who believe in his name and in his power to save, to heal, and to deliver. It doesn't matter your location this morning, in self-isolation, on hospital bed, at home with your family, wherever you are hearing and listening to this message today, I want to assure you that what Jesus did for Israel in the wilderness where they were being beaten by fiery serpents, what he did for a woman with the issue of blood, he can do for all regardless of circumstances, situation, ailment, disease by whatsoever name. Let's go to Mark chapter 5, beginning from verse 25, to learn from the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Mark chapter number 5, beginning from verse 25. Now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. Can you imagine the plague? For 12 years. And at suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. As you are hearing me today, and you are releasing your faith in the seven grace and the healing power of Jesus Christ, you also will be healed of all kinds of affliction that you may have presently. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, King James Version of the Bible says, virtue had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Uh, but his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging, oh Lord, thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see how we had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your fate has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. This story you have heard several times perhaps in church. But you will be wondering, why was the woman trembling? Why was she afraid? She had just received a miracle. She was afraid because she had no right under ceremonial law to come into the midst of crowd like you are isolated today. If she were to come at all like a leper, she must be ringing a bell and be shouting unclean, unclean, unclean. But in herself, she knew that this Jesus could identify with her infirmities and sickness and she went through the people despite un an uncleanness, our uncleanness, and grabbed the hem of his garment. And if you know anything about the hem of the garment of the, of the priest in those days, he had bells, he had fruit, and it was laden with ribbon, blue ribbon, representing the presence of God. So what that woman was saying was not just any cloth. He was saying, if I could touch, if I could tap into his presence, and to his anointing, I will be made well. She said so in her heart. And as she touched the hem of his garment, she was made well. As you release your faith today, you also will be made well. The affliction was for 12 years. I don't know how long you have been on your hospital bed or in your sick bed, but the Lord is sending me to you today in this healing service online that by the same way this woman was healed, as you release your faith today, the same healing power will flow towards you. Jesus said, virtue left me. His disciples said, people are thronging you. 
There's something about that touch that was different. There are people today waiting for preachers to lay hands on them. And until hands are laid on them, they don't believe. But this woman, rather than waiting for Jesus to touch her, decided to touch Jesus. That touch was different. And that was why Jesus said, wow, somebody had released an extraordinary faith here, not waiting for me to come to her home, not waiting for me to lay my hands on her, but he decided to touch me and virtue left me. May virtue of God flow through the screen into you today in the name of Jesus and reverse the curse of sickness and disease and plague in your life in Jesus' mighty name. Now the question now is, can Jesus do the same for all other people with similar or different ailments? Or you have to reinvent the wheel all over again and find another means of getting to him? Can he do the same? Remember, Jesus, the same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. What he has done for one, he can do for all. Mark chapter 6, verse 53 to 56. Mark chapter 6. Just some, one chapter after chapter 5, after the story of the woman with the issue of blood, the story must have gone everywhere. People heard and released their faith accordingly. So in Mark 6, 53, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. I'll talk about that later. The people recognized him. Ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces I hope you're hearing me today just so you're in the marketplace or your business is dying and your trade is collapsing and you are scared. Jesus' power still functions also in the marketplace. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. What one person did became a pattern for others. They were not asking him for special prayers. You have released this power by faith of a woman. This power was released. We are also asking for the virtue to be released to us. More or less, they were saying that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. As many as touched him were made well. My dear friends, you do not need to reinvent the wheel this morning. Just do what those people did. Set aside your religious belief to the contrary. Recognize Jesus for who he is, a savior and healer. And release your faith in his ability to save and heal you. That's all. But if you don't recognize that, all the preaching I would do today will be a waste of your time and mine. But if you set aside your sentiments, your superstitions, your wrong belief systems, and misconceptions about the Savior of the world, and you release your faith in him, just as they recognize Jesus, you recognize him, you receive what they also receive, because God is no respecter of persons. By his grace, as I pray for you now, it will touch you wherever you are, since there is no distance in the spirit. And those of you hearing me who know those who are sick, or those who have tested positive to COVID-19, you can also stand in the gap for them, as I pray right now, because there is no distance in the spirit. If I can use my phone to call you, and you can receive at home, and it will be like I'm next to you, there is no distance whatsoever in the spiritual realm. Please lay your hand on yourself. As I pray this morning, I'm praying that the power of Jesus will flow this morning to you where you are and will heal you of your sickness and disease. And no matter what you are tested positive to, it will reverse the condition and restore your health. As you listen to me right now, release your faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all those who are sick 
and those who are proved positive, tested positive to COVID-19, in the name of Jesus, you who heal the sick, cleanse lepers, restore eyesight to the blind, you cause the lame to work, you raise the dead, even the one that was buried and was stinking already after four days. Lazarus by name, you call him forth, and he came out of the place of the dead. Today in the name of Jesus, as people release their faith in your ability and grace to heal and to deliver, I'm sending your word to them, Father. Heal them and deliver them from their afflictions in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want you to believe God that a miracle has taken place if you believe in your heart and you confess in your mouth with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, your Savior, and your healer and your deliverer. Then healing is yours today in Jesus' name. Now let me spend the second half of the one hour we have today on some teaching that I believe will fortify every believer in this season and beyond in the name of Jesus. Without any shadow of doubt, perilous times are not about to come, they are here. However, before COVID-19 hit the planet, God had declared the year 2020 to us as our year of immeasurable grace. And one of the words that we received early in the year, on the first day of the year, that this year is a year of social, economic, and political inversion. That many that are first shall be last, and many that are last shall be first. I'm coming to you with the same immeasurable grace this morning to thank God on your behalf and my behalf that God has not left us in the dark. And I trust God that just as Noah found grace in the sight of God, which energized his faith, enabled him and his household to believe God and to obey him and to escape a global disaster, so shall we who have received immeasurable grace this year escape unhurt in the current and future pandemics in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. For those who may be wondering what is going on in the world as well as in the church, I already answered that question in part last Wednesday during our online City Impact Bible study. And you can also join us online for part two next Wednesday at 7 p.m. by God's grace. However, for the benefit of those who did not join us last Wednesday, You'll be able to watch and listen to the same message today on Channels Television at 5 p.m. It is titled, Godly Insight into the Coronavirus Pandemic. Please spread the news to your friends and family. We all need spiritual fortification more than ever before. In addition to all the physical fortification of hand washing with hot water and soap, vitamin C, sanitizers, face masks, and social distancing. My prayer for you all is that when the dust settles, we will all still be standing and we will have the last laugh in Jesus' mighty name. The subject of my contemplation, our contemplation this morning, is in a question format, a very simple question. The subject of our contemplation is, where do you live? Where do you live? The answer to that simple question, to my mind, will determine whether an individual survives or dies in the midst of this current or future pandemic. As scary as that may sound, as I begin to unfold this teaching and begin to show you revelation and what God has taught me, you will discover that I'm not trying to scare you. Where you live will determine what happens to you in the midst of a disaster. At this juncture, let us have some definitions. And this is for clarity's sake. I would like to define the word on what's being used and thrown at us up and down by the media in their frantic bombardment of the hair waves in recent times. Some of you may be wondering as to what the word pandemic means. I know the Google generation can quickly go there, but listen to me, I have something to teach. 
That's why I'm defining the words in simple terms. You may be familiar with the words epidemic or endemic, but what in the word is pandemic? I will define all the three words, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic for you. And at the end, I will also add the word pandemonium to the list so that you know that where you live in this season matters very much. As I said before, where you live right now is a matter of life and death. That is to say, where you live right now will determine whether you live or you succumb to COVID-19 pandemic, scary as, the, as that may seem. Let me deal with definitions. Let's start with the word endemic. The word endemic is used to describe a disease that is restricted to a particular region or a people and that is not time bad like an epidemic. That is, it's not time bad. It's something that has become endemic. It's a disease that is restricted to a particular region or a people, so much so that it has become uh, more or less their lifestyle, what they're used to, and they carry on life as if it doesn't matter anymore. I don't need to pontificate before you know that there is an endemic corruption in our nation without a doubt. And wherever there is corruption, you'll find its twin evil or twin devil, namely violence. Violence will always be eminently present. In Genesis chapter 6, when there was no treasury, government treasury to loot, when there was no uh, mineral resources, anybody was mining uh, seriously at that time. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, the Bible records that the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Corruption is not a new thing. In so many climate and culture and nations, it's become endemic. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh without exception had corrupted their way on the earth with an exception. The man who found grace in the sight of God by the name of Noah. Unknown to many, there is a biblical cure for this malaise. And that's why I'm appealing to children of God, to those who are eminently qualified within the church, because they know righteousness, righteousness is what exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach unto a people. As many as are called to the mountain of government and politics, do not let religion hold you bound. Break free and go to that mountain and make a difference. And chase the lions and the goliaths on the mountain away from there because biblical cure for corruption, as far as the word of God is concerned, is a manifestation of the sons of God. Romans chapter 8 Verse 18 to 21, Romans 8, 20, 18 to 21. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to compare with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For in the, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. In KJV it says manifestation, in the new KJV it says revealing. For the revealing or the manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself, verse 21, also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children or the sons of God. I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Don't stay at home and say politics is dirty. Somebody needs to go there and clean it. I want you to recall that everyone that God used to shape the nations and to shape the nations yielded to him and obeyed him. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Joseph in Egypt, Daniel in Babylon, Esther in the palace of Ahasuerus, and Nehemiah the butler who became the governor of Judah. They were not politicians. At best, you could call them kingdom people who carried in the, the virtues and the values of the kingdom 
into the arena dominated by the wicked and dominated the Israel of nations and caused righteousness and the standard of God's kingdom to change the nation. We have kept our people captive for too long in churches and whenever anyone speaks, they say, oh, don't use your pulpit for politics. I'm not a politician, I'm a nation builder. And by the grace of God in my lifetime, Nigeria will be saved, Nigeria will be changed, and Nigeria will become a great nation as the Lord leaves. This is my assignment, this is my destiny. And not only me, many other people will join in this clarion call. Thank God that today what looked impossible is possible. We have a vice president who is a pastor. That door is already open. There's space in that mountain and nobody can shut it against us because of certain religious beliefs and because of some superstition that hey, go godly men do not get involved with politics. The government is upon the shoulder of Jesus Christ and Isaiah declared, the Lord is our judge, that's the judiciary. The Lord is our lawgiver, that's the parliament. And the Lord is our king, that's the executive arm of government. All the three are in God. It's time to rise up and time for the manifestation of the sons of God to put this endemic corruption in our nation aside and to begin to raise the standards of God's kingdom. We can minimize it and God helping us who will do. Next word, the word epidemic. The word epidemic is used to describe a disease which becomes widespread in a particular place and at a particular time. Now, Limitation in terms, widespread in terms of place and time is the difference between endemic and epidemic. So you, some of you will still remember the cholera epidemic that once killed many people in certain parts of our country at a time. That's not the story anymore. The word epidemic is also used to describe an occurrence generally unpleasant, which is widespread and intense. For example, before the rude invasion of coronavirus, coronavirus into the planet, there was the epidemic of kidnapping in Nigeria that made interstate and night travels a no-go area for many of our citizens in our nation. Even in broad daylight, children and young people were kidnapped by heartless men from churches and schools of all places. May the good Lord deliver those still held in captivity by these kidnappers and may God comfort those who have lost family members to this epidemic called kidnapping in Jesus' name. I am of the considered opinion that if our government and lawmakers had strictly followed the injunctions of the Bible, the kidnapping epidemic would have been drastically reduced, if not completely eliminated. You say, where is that in the word of God? Exodus chapter 21, verse number 16. Exodus 21, 16. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if it's found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. You cannot be holier than God. God said, when you get a kidnapper, death sentence is what he deserves. Why? Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 7 will answer that question for you. The answer is in Deuteronomy 24 7. If a man is found, I'm quoting, if a man is found kidnapping, you can put the word stealing there. If you look in the middle column of your Bible, the word kidnapping is stealing. If a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren of the children of Israel and mistreats him or sells him, then the kidnapper shall die and you shall put away the evil from among you. That's the reason for that punishment. May God help our government and lawmakers to put away this evil from among us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now let me come to the word pandemic before we go to pandemonium. The word pandemic is used to describe a disease affecting either a whole country or the whole world. Not part of the country. Not part of the world. The word pandemic is used to describe a disease affecting a whole country or the whole world. It is from the Greek word Pandemos, which means universe. So if you live anywhere in this universe, Leki or Mushi, it doesn't matter. Abuja or Enugu, whether you close your gate or you shut your gate or not, 
London or New York, and we have all seen it in Spain, in Italy, in Canada, everywhere, you are a prime target. It does not matter whether you are male or female, young or old, rich or poor. As long as you live anywhere on this planet, you are a prime target to any pandemic virus or disease. But I have good news for you, and I want you to think about it. The good news is that there is an exception to a pandemic plague such as COVID-19. I would like to repeat myself, and I want you to hear me well. If the word pandemonia, uh, uh, pandemos means universe, and it makes everyone on the planet a target, and I'm saying good news, there's an exception to that, and that exception is what I want to share with you today. The good news, there's an exception to a pandemic plague such as COVID-19. What is the exception? The only exception is to be separated from the world. I didn't say isolated, I said separated. The only exception is to be separated from the world. So I'm not talking of self-isolation, good as that may be in the interim. I'm talking rather of you and your dwelling place being in the world and not being part of the world. Just as Goshen, the dwelling place of Israel, was in Egypt in the days of Joseph and subsequently Moses, but what befell Egypt did not befall Goshen. Let us spend some time to locate Goshen in the Bible. And I think I will continue next Sunday from this level after defining pandemonium to you. Let us locate Goshen in the Bible. The word Goshen means draw near. That's what it means, draw near. There's a natural or physical Goshen and there's a spiritual Goshen. For example, if you follow the counsel and the admonition of Apostle James by drawing near to God so that God can draw near to you, you'll be creating your own Goshen wherever you live. There's a spiritual geography. There's geography in the spirit. You can create your own atmosphere. In your own dwelling place, you can create your own Goshen because the word means draw near. If you draw near to God, it will draw near to you. Listen to Apostle James in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. James 4, 7 and 8. Therefore submit to God. Receive the devil and he will flee from you. <laughs> I don't care how much anointing you have shouting on devils to come out and screaming on the top of your voice. If you have not submitted to God, Satan cannot flee from you because of a simple principle that you must be set under authority for those beneath you and under you to listen to you because you are listening to a higher authority that is also leading you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. That's not, no sanitizer can do that. No washing of hands with hot water and soap can do that. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. That's a spiritual sanitizer. And purify your heart because your heart determines what the hand is doing. What is flowing out of your heart is affecting what you say, is affecting what you do. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. And purify your heart, you double-minded. Principally, uh, a double-minded person cannot receive anything from God. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. All the soap in the world, all the water in the world cannot cleanse your hand and your heart or mind. Now, let us see Bruce 9, 13 and 14. I'm talking about Goshen. I'm talking about drawing near. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heaver sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So when you hear about gushing, I want you to know there's natural gushing and there's spiritual gushing. Now, let's go to natural gushing. The natural, the physical gushing, you find it located in Egypt. But there was also another one located in the promised land. That's why I say you can create your own gushing. There was gushing in Egypt, 
<laughs> but there was another Goshen in the promised land. I guarantee that many of you listening to me this morning, I'm not trying to show up. You only know of Goshen in Egypt, but I will show you the one in Israel later as you listen to me. Now, where is Goshen in Egypt? Joseph the dreamer, who was hated by his brothers. As men hate dreamers, they hate visionary leaders, they hate those who are saying this is the direction to go. They sold him into slavery. But God had a different purpose. As Joseph the dreamer went to Egypt, he went through all kinds of anguish and pain until he stood before Pharaoh, interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and brought a blueprint for economic survival that affected the entire planet, that made him a blessing to the whole world, according to the covenant God had with Abraham, that in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He brought forth a blueprint from that dream that made him father to Pharaoh and ruler over all Egypt and one who taught the senators of Egypt wisdom. It was this Joseph who allocated Goshen to his father, his brothers, and their families even before they settled in Egypt. I perceive when he was going around at the age of 30, before the famine hit and was building storage facilities, he had located Goshen. And something in him said, wow, what a land. He kept the best for his own people. And listen to this. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 to 15. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 to 15 is important for us to locate this Goshen in Egypt as we locate Goshen in Israel. And then we have already said, there's a spiritual Goshen that can be yours if you learn to draw near to God and submit to his authority. Genesis 45, beginning from verse number 3. Genesis 45, verse 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, the best kept secret in Canaan. <laughs> they thought he was dead. Here comes a dreamer. Let us kill him and see what will become of his dreams. God's dream never dies. If you do anything to one who God has given a dream, you can only propel them and push them into their destiny. You cannot kill God's dreams. God's dreams don't die. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. The minister of finance said a few days ago that we are very close to recession. People are scared. People are asking questions. Foreign investment is flying away from us. What is going to happen to us? The God of heavens, it will prosper us. It will bless us. It will give us creative ideas. In the midst of our mess, it will bring forth a message. Because it's time for Joseph's to take the reins of power in this country. And no one can stop them. I will be able to stop them in the name of Jesus. There are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me. You must be sent. You can't go on a fraud of your own. It cannot be ambition. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. And to save your lives by great deliverance. In the name of Jesus, regardless of what the future holds and the natural for this nation, God will grant us a great deliverance. In Jesus' mighty name. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me, listen to it, he has made me a father to Pharaoh. Many people thought he was second in command to Pharaoh. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house. And a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph. God has made me Lord <laughs> of all Egypt, not through 
uh, uh, election. I contested. I won. No. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. Do not delay. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. That's the first time you find it in the Bible. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me. That's the meaning of the word Goshen. Draw near. You shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. For there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Mm. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he killed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This was the first time Goshen appeared in the entire Bible. It was Joseph who, by his word, allocated the land of Goshen to Jacob's family and all his brothers and their wives and their children. But he did not undermine the authority of Pharaoh. Pharaoh also granted consent. It's important that we do things decently and in order. There's no point praying for anybody to die so that you come into power. No. Ambition ruins. Ambition destroys. As the Lord lives, the president will leave. His vice will leave. They will declare the works of God. But no one can stop whatever God wants to do. Let God be God and you be you. Yield to his sovereignty. Accept your humanity. Joseph, because he was promoted, did not undermine the authority of, of, of Pharaoh. Pharaoh consented to the land of Goshen being given to the children of Israel. Let's look at that quickly. Verse number 16. Now, Genesis 45, 16. Now, the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So he pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Why? How? They were not Egyptians. They will be strangers, at best, refugees in some instances, but because of the role that God has enabled Joseph to play when Joseph allocated by words of mouth to his, his brethren and his family, Pharaoh consented. Let me go further. Verse 20. Also, do not be concerned about your goods. I love the way it is put in King James Version. Do not regard your stuff. Do not regard your stuff. Why? For the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Do not regard your stuff, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. This is the problem of those who hold tight to what they have and are easily offended when they hear anything about giving tight and offering to God. I challenge you today, regard not your stuff, so that the best of all the land can be yours. Was that promise kept? Promise made by Joseph and Pharaoh. Was it kept? Genesis chapter 46, 26 to 28. Genesis 46, 26 to 28. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's son's wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. They became like 6 million people before they left. 600,000 able-bodied men, minus women and children. They were all 70. Verse 28. Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph. Why Judah? 
You will see when we get to where we are going this morning. I'm about to round up. Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. <laughs> it will take praise to get you there. It will take praise. It will take worship. It will take obeying God and serving him to get you there and before, to, to show the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. Hmm. Genesis 47, verse 11. Genesis 47, 11. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, uh, in the best of the land. That was what Pharaoh said. So Goshen was the best of the land. In the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded, then Joseph provided his father, uh -oh, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread according to the number in their families. Remember, there was famine in the land, but there was provision in Goshen. Look at verse 13. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. But there was bread in Goshen. Where you live in this season matters. Where you live in this season matters. God will keep his side of the promise if you will obey and not rebel against him. The difference between Goshen and Egypt became very clear when plague after plague hit the land of Egypt in the days of Moses. I'll get back to that next Sunday by God's grace. You will see that when swarms of flies filled the land of Egypt, there was not a single fly, no single demonic operation in the whole of Goshen. You can read that before we meet next Sunday. Exodus 8, 20 to 23, swarms of flies filled everywhere, including the throne room of, 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 of Pharaoh. But there was not a single fly in Goshen. And when God's darkness that could be felt, in Exodus chapter 10, when God's darkness that could be felt covered the whole land of Egypt, Goshen within Egypt had light. There was no electricity then, but it had light. The presence of God, the illumination of God, not the powers of Illuminati, put light in Goshen. I'm telling you that in the name of Jesus, the gross darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but you will arise, or the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. You are going to arise and you are going to shine in the midst of this mess. And to glad that the Goshen experience was recreated as Goshen became part of the inheritance of the tribe of Judah. It was Judah that pointed the way to Goshen, and when they eventually settled in their own land, they recreated that phenomenon called Judah, and that land was allocated to them. Joshua chapter 10, verse number 41. This is not, Josh, this is not Goshen <laughs> in Egypt now. This is Goshen in the promised land. Joshua chapter 10. Verse number 41, and Joshua conquered them from Kadesh Benia as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen, even as far as Gibeon. And so when they conquered Goshen in the promised land, to whom was, it, was the land allocated? Chapter 15, verses 20 and 51. Chapter 15, verse 20 and 51. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. Wow. What land did they give to them among others? Verse 51. Goshen, Holon, and Gelo, 11 cities with their villages. It was Judah that pointed the way to Jacob, where they would settle, because it was Judah who offered himself to pay ransom for Benjamin, so that Benjamin could return to his father. Listen to me in the name of Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah had paid the price. Where you live in this season matters. If you live in Goshen, it does not matter what befalls the world. You will escape. But if you live in Egypt, whatever affects Egypt will affect you. Brothers and sisters, it gladdens my heart. And I consider it very important for every believer to know that Jesus said to this matter once and for all in his high priestly prayer 
before he went to the cross. He is a lion of the tribe of Judah who has broken every yoke. Our Lord and Savior made it clear that we may be in the world, but we are not of the world. I want you to listen to the master as he prayed for us in John 17, verses 10 and 11. John 17, 10 and 11. And I'll read 14 and 17, and I'll bring this message to a close. Verses 10 and 11 of John 17. And all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world. Don't listen to those who talk about digital currency. They will deceive you. Except all yours are his. All his cannot be yours in the means of global crisis. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine. I'm glorifying in them. Now I'm no longer in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, including COVID-19, COVID whatever it is called, uh, coronavirus. Keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, verse 16, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you send me into the world, I also have sent them to the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by truth. Brothers and sisters, truth separates. And what separates us from the world is the word of God. I will leave the definition of pandemonium to next Sunday because it really means the headquarters of hell. The word pandemonium means headquarters of hell. It means a state of utter confusion and uproar. Have you been looking at CNN lately? What do you see by chaos and a state of confusion among world leaders? The word pandemonium is from the French word pandemonium. Pan, which means all, and demon, which means demon. It's a name for the capital of, of hell coined by Milton. And I will show you next Sunday that to depart from the presence of God is to step into hell. Today, where you live matters. I pray the truth you have heard will separate you from the world so that you can create your own Goshen environment and regardless of what is befalling Egypt, no plague will come near your dwelling. Where do you live? Where you live in this season matters. Next Sunday, we'll be looking at our dwelling place is God. God is our dwelling place. God bless you. Thank you for listening to me. Go ahead and honor God with your substance. Bless his holy name, not only with your money, but with your entire life, so that people will see the difference between those who serve God and serve him not. I love you, and I can't stop doing what I'm doing. God bless you. Till I see you on Wednesday at 7 p.m. and on Sunday at 10 a.m. Bye for now.